Hello, and welcome to That Eurovision Podcast, Eurovision with a slice of life. My name is Rory, and uh, I'm not doing too bad today. A little bit sad that uh, at the time of recording, it would have been the first week of rehearsals right now for the 2020 contest, so a little bit bummed out on that sense. But you know what? We're having more and more uh, Eurovision content brought to us by not only just us, but several other Eurovision websites and the contest itself, so who can go wrong with that? And uh, joining me... Uh, Jazzy, um, yeah, I, I definitely share the sentiment that I'm a little bit bummed that it would be the first week of rehearsals, but it is what it is. And yeah, I'm definitely very, very grateful for all the Eurovision content that the, fa- that the fandoms like the fandom started initiatives the uh well, the way the fan sites are trying to make sure that we get some content and the way you, the, the ebu and you with the home concerts are also trying to plug in as much content as they possibly can and i think i think i speak for everyone where we just want to say thank a thank you for that as well in these times that feels so wholesome yeah <laughs> I'm not sure how I can follow that. (laughs) (laughs) Give it a good go. Give it a good go. Yeah. Hi, I am Rosie. I am fresh out of a four hour long meeting. So I am delighted to be here talking about something that isn't training people. Um, And yeah, I do. I do sort of echo what what Jazzy said. I did see a tweet the other day that said Eurofans will literally rank anything they possibly can during <laughs> the off season. And since this is basically extended off season, I've been just living for the random rankings that have turned up. So, like I saw someone ranking the 2007 postcards based on how well they show social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> And quite wow. frankly, I'm here for it. Wow. Um, and the other thing as well that we've had recently is we've got a proper Kano cover of Hatred Monsegra, so I'm happy. Oh, that I saw that and I absolutely loved it. I who would have figured that Schlager pop, whatever Kano is, like and like BDSM electronic pop, like what? It's just like who would have thought that was even like possible? Anyway. Okay. Hey guys, it's Tim here. And I do share everyone's sentiments. Um, I, I woke up at 7 a.m. this morning, and on my email was a reminder that said, your flight to Rotterdam is tomorrow. Consider checking in. Oh. And... <laughs> Ouch. Oh. Yeah. That yeah. Times. Yeah, I was like, no, this is not what I need at 7 a.m. in the morning. A flight, a, a notice for a flight that's already been cancelled and it's still tell, it's telling me to check in. Thanks a lot, Outlook reminder. But yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I, I, it's like, you know, all my three bag, all my three suitcases were ready and then the concert, and then the contest got cancelled. Had to unpack all of them. But yes, I was going to be in the press centre this, this year and that kind of bummed me out that I'm going to miss the press center experience, but I am grateful that I had it somehow last year. But in today's though, it, it looks kind of sunny from where I am. So there's a plus side to that. And it was raining earlier on. So which kind of pushed, like giving me some motivation to do some work. (laughs) See, that's always the way, isn't it? You know, you always want to get stuff done and then all of a sudden the weather just has to be, Oh yeah, let's have that. Nice. (laughs) But um, yes, so this week we're going to be uh, diverging a little bit from our previous couple of episodes and we're going to be having a little bit of a retrospective year. And this is in conjunction with Eurovision again, who for the past few weeks have been providing us with the oh so needed uh, Eurovision years and Eurovision coverage that we should be really getting this year, but because of the current pandemic we're not really allowed to. So uh, this week we're going to be talking about the the most recent uh, year of uh, Eurovision again that took place the Saturday just gone, the 2007 contest, which was held in Helsinki, Finland. And uh, I, I, just to kick us off, like how old were you when you like when the 2007 contest was on? Obviously, from the first episode, uh, a lot of us. They, they, like 2007 was pretty much one of our first years 
of actually being involved <laughs> in Eurovision. So looking back on it, does it still have that same sort of nostalgic feeling for you? Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. I was 11. I was 11. Yes. So. Yeah, I was, um, I was like 11 and 10 months. And um, I just moved to the UK the year before. So I was like, what on earth is Eurovision? And I watched it. I was like, okay. I mean, it was at that time where I didn't, I didn't get full fledged fan mode into it but there's some there's some sort of inkling that i'm gonna get delved into it but i'm not aware of it yet but yeah all, all i knew was that scooch was there and that oh our song's really great and i watched it during the lotto results <laughs> but other than that yeah 11 year old me thought scooch was the best thing ever yeah same really? exactly. 12 year old me would agree oh, oh. <laughs> 25-year-old me probably would back that. <laughs> oh, no, 24-year-old yes. me definitely backs that. Oh, yeah, 24-year-old me backs that as well. I'm just here just being like, I don't know her. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Irish in you. Yeah, that's the Irish. It's like, uh, British people? Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we don't claim her. No, uh, yeah, no, I don't know her. She, we do not, uh, we would like to formally disassociate ourselves with this uh, establishment. <laughs> and that is basically most of Irish history that right there. That is it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I was, uh, I was eight when, uh, when 2007, when it was 2007. And I kind of had an idea of what Eurovision was like a couple of years beforehand, because I have some kind of memory of, uh, 2005 and 2006 but 2007 was the first year that I properly sat down and watched it and honestly looking back on it though it, I think it has aged really really well apparently though that's a very controversial subject because during the Eurovision again Twitter stream um, there was a lot of people who seemed to think that 2007 was almost like a low point for the contest which I, I think personally no. Uh, 2008. Have they watched 2008? Yeah. I mean, 2008, like... I think that was the that was the true low point. I think it had to change from there. But I feel I... like in 2008, everyone was too busy trying to emulate Verka's success mm. and not doing it very well. Definitely. <laughs> they gave it a good go. <laughs> I think on 2007, looking at it, you know, with a fresh perspective and not have watched it for so long. I think with 2007, I think the one thing that sticks out the most is the left-hand side of that scoreboard. And I think that's kind of like where it's like it's a low point for some countries where it's like, you know, there's not a good balance here kind of thing. Yeah. But but I think, I mean, the, it was a good show. It was a lot of diverse entries. And, you know, the, the fact that, you know, just because you're a certain country does not mean that you're going to do well. So on that fact, I, there was a lot of pops on there. So I will give 2007 that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, 2007, when you look at the, like, the entries that actually did take part in 2007, you can't deny that there were some of them have actually stayed very relevant and very kind of contemporary, even for like nowadays, really. Like, I think for 2007, mm -hmm. there was something for everyone. Like, there was, like, music-wise, like, depending on what genre of music you were into. And I think that, I think some contests, that <clears throat> that's not always been the case. Yeah. But in 2007, it definitely is. Like, it, it, even if you go back far, as far back as the semi-finals, is the semi, well, the semi-final in 2007 throughout all the songs in 2007 there is a specific style for everyone like to be able to get into and be able to enjoy and i think i think finland also made the contest very fun and enjoyable to watch as a mm -hmm. whole i mean if you look at it like um a semi-final with 28 countries <laughs> That's the thing. That would you know you're not doing well when the semi-final is longer than the final. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that's partially EBU's fault. That is, so. Yeah, I mean, 
like, Finland was just trying to handle what the EBU was giving them. So, you know, we, yeah. don't, we don't blame Ulla for that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. But um, just to give a sense of, I guess, our musical tastes, who were your top three from the 2007 contest? And that includes people who were in the uh, semifinals as well. My top three in 2007 were Finland, Serbia and Georgia. Excellent choices. Nice. nice. Ooh. Ooh. I actually just had to go and find the rankings that I sent to my partner <laughs> on the night because he joined in watching it with me as well. Aww, um, nice. And my top three were Serbia, Ukraine and France. France, interesting. I have a real nostalgia soft spot I, for La I Moire la Française. Really like France, but... I have a proper soft spot for that song and I think a lot of it is a nostalgia thing. Um, mm-hmm. 2007 is sort of the year where I remember more than one performance and the sort of the first time when I can specifically say I remember watching this act and this act and this act yeah. and so and I think the thing with that one is A, the guy had a cat collar and B, he really <laughs> looked like my French teacher at the time Oh my god And I've never been able to make that disassociation <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it could have actually been your French teacher, for all we know. <laughs> it's like my French teacher was from Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it was in Franglais. That's why. Yes. <laughs> Because he couldn't be bothered singing it fully in French, so that's why he'd just do it in Franglais, just make a half assed attempt. <laughs> His English was far too understandable for it to be from Yorkshire. <laughs> Um, for me, I'll go in the reverse order, so not to kill the surprise. Ooh. Third place um, for me is, surprise, surprise, Scooch. Nice. Uh, <laughs> look, like I said, I like good, fun feeling, like a feel-good entry. And this was, you know, with the current pandemic and we're all feeling kind of terrible, um, you know, Scooch really cheered me up, especially I, I, and, and and seeing that performance um, kind of reminded me of one of the members of Scooch. I forgot what, what his name is now. Uh, yeah, but either one of them. I don't know if you guys remember this. You re- do you know how like with Eurovision entries they have to promote this on Blue Peter? And oh then- yes. Yes, and then, they had to change and then, the words because they couldn't say all the innuendos for the kiddies. <laughs> oh, why do I not remember love this? Love that, love that. Would you like to... I can't even say it with Is, the screen. Would you like a sweet, sir? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, David had to say that, and then I think his facial expression was just like, he felt really uncomfortable changing that, that word. Oh. I think even performing it, and then, you know, on, on primetime Europe, which would like to suck something for that. <laughs> but yeah, um, UK's third, because of the feel-good thing, it, it kind of like gives us at this time, at yeah. this time. Um, second is Serbia, because, you know, you have to be serious at some point. And rounding up my top three is obviously Verka and you know a a good fun good feeling but then again if you know if Eleni was there instead of Verka I'd give that to Eleni Hmm. to be fair I mean everyone thinks that um oh Verka just took the piss out of the entire show but if you think about it Verka has kind of become an icon so really Mm -hmm. Maybe, like, like, taking the piss out of yourself actually is a good thing. It's definitely one of the most memorable entries. Oh, 100%. Definitely in the 21st century. 100%. For myself, now, I guess I'm not as fun as uh, as the rest of you. Although, there are, I have put some of them in my top ten, some of the good songs that were a little bit more quirky. But my third place was Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mm-hmm. Because that, like... I know um, Jazzy kind of disagrees with me on this, but yeah, um, I think that uh, Rieka Bezimina was quite possibly one of the best songs to actually open up a final because it's sto- it slow it starts off very slow and kind of quiet, and then as it goes on, it gets bigger, like, bigger, <laughs> bigger, bigger. <laughs> it gets wider, it gets all of that. It gets all of that, and then it just kind of grows into this 
big kind of Balkan ballad, and I think that's just so cool. I think that's so cool. Um, and then for my second place is Bulgaria, and I am a dedicated Elitsa and Stoyan stan. Like this just rem- this just reminds me of like like my my family time because a lot of my brothers and sisters used to listen to this kind of like trance music. And so it kind of brings back that nostalgia sense, like how you had with the France Rosie. Um, and then obviously, if you follow me on Twitter, this will come as no surprise, but uh, my number one is Georgia. Mostly just because A, it's actually showing off cultural uh, instrumentation, cultural identity. Second, that drop into the chorus just gets me every single time oh ah, it's so good it's so good and then as well just the whole aesthetic of the entry as well like the pink and the blue and the staging and then her like like her red dress and then like the things that come on her back as well i think just the whole aesthetic and then the dancers just like playing with the sword the whole time who do- who wouldn't love that kind of thing? Yes, it is a health and safety issue f- till the cows come home, but <laughs> it's worth it because it's cultural, it's an absolute bop, and it was delivered practically perfectly. So, you know, you can't go wrong. I always find Georgia one of the most underrated countries as far as Eurovision entries go, and I still have a lot of bitterness about a lot of their entries not doing as well as they should have done. Mm. And it was nice to see them actually get some recognition um, for sending some good stuff, because I, nine times out of ten, I will adore what they send. No, so obviously we had a semi-final of 28 songs competing for 10 spaces to go into a final of 24 songs. So, of course, there was going to be heartbreak here, left, right, and centre. Um, so, <laughs> who do you think from the semi-final, who do you think should have qualified? Oh, I can give you one. Um, on top of my head, Andorra. Really? Yes. Yes. Share that like, argument. what's really frustrating is that... Let me just get the results up. How many points? There were 12. It was 11 points that, like kept them from the final wow weren't they a big favorite as well going into the contest yeah they were and all the fans loved them the the fans were like the fans were dead certain that they were going to qualify wasn't i don't know if it was actual true wasn't there a big sign held up during the final where is andorra where is andorra (laughs) (laughs) oh my god yeah they i think that sign made in a but continuous appearance throughout Andorra's participation in the contest from 2004 onward, just being like, ha! I'm now imagining the robots from San Marino in 2018 holding that sign up. <laughs> Sometimes size doesn't matter, unless you're Andorra. <laughs> unless you're Andorra, in which case, you're cut off. But, um, yeah, I think, I think Andorra is one of those countries, like, I think that song was very much of its time. As in 2007, Lordy had just won. So of course, rock was going to be a very in thing. Not to mention as well, the kind of current musical style stylings at the time, a lot of successful bands were kind of punk rock, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it would make sense that um, but Andorra were kind of big fans. For me, this song was more accessible almost than Heart Power. Yeah, it had more of a poppy feel than Lordy had done, and obviously they weren't dressed like like, like monsters or or anything like that. Um, it the song felt a little bit more contemporary, and I'm just shocked. I I think I'm still shocked to this day that it didn't like. Hmm. I mean, when I'm looking at the the semi final, there were a lot of songs that I think should have qualified, but I. I but I think for the most part, there are. I'm kind of am happy with the lineup of the ones that qualified. Like I'm definitely mm-hmm. happy with the final. Words, obviously, I think there's some that were in the top ten from the previous year that I'm just think, yeah, you should not have been in that final. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, but... but the thing is, that did you know that there's a bit of an embarrassment on here? Somebody returned on the twenty. 20- 2007 contest, they had to take part in the semi-final and didn't qualify. 
Someone who came so, back. Yeah, somebody came back. Oh. And then. Is oh. it um, a silly Rumble? Yeah. Yeah. How... She, came, she, 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 she landed at 21st. Oh my God. And then she came like, was it fourth or something in 1998? Yeah, I think it was third or fourth. Yeah. Or something like that. But, oh wow. What a tank. <laughs> but. To be perfectly honest, that wasn't my cup of tea. If it was, if I had the choice of picking a couple of other people to have gone through to the final, I think I would have picked uh, Cyprus because I oh, think Cyprus yeah. was truly robbed. I think because first off, Evrediki, she came back. She she participated nearly three times before then, or two times before then, um, mm -hmm. and she had. She had done, you know, very like kind of somewhat well in both of her years. So mm -hmm. obviously coming back, singing a song in completely in French as well is completely different. Um, I think it was a really good effort, and I think a lot of people expected it to qualify as well. So then when it didn't mm -hmm. qualify, it was a big shock. And then I do, and then there are two other songs that I know people didn't really like, but I have a bit of a soft spot for. <laughs> Um, and they are Malta and Albania. Oh, I really like Malta. Mm -hmm. I like Malta. Malta's another one of those countries I think are really underrated most of the time. Yeah. Oh, and yes. Maybe it's singing a song called Warrior in 2015 that means you're underrated. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> I was like, 11th, 11th. What? The one, one thing that frustrated me about that, though, is that... Um, had the new i was gonna say there's another thing if had had if we had like the voting mechanisms in 2020 in 2007 i don't think the landscape of that final would look the same oh definitely not no i think, Who do you some, think we would have gained and lost i think we would have gained uh i think we would have gained andorra I think, um, who else? Potentially the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, looking at, I think we could, we could have potentially lost. Uh, where else am I looking here? Maybe Bulgaria? I don't know. Oh. Well, look, oh. Okay, the only, thing, the, only, the only reason I say that is that look what happened in 2013. That's fair. That's fair, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know that's a that's a bit of a heartbreak, and I I'm ready I'm ready for the shtick that's gonna come with me. But I will say another thing is Carolina may have potentially because she was nine tenth. Mm. Mm. I think I think as well we could have potentially gained Andorra. We could have also gained Iceland as well. I think I remember Iceland was kind of a fan favorite as well. But I could mm -hmm. I I could be wrong. But um. But I do think we could have lost Macedonia. I think we probably would have lost Moldova as well. Maybe even Latvia as well. Yeah, I think, although it did come fifth, I don't know if a jury, like, nowadays would have got it. Like, I think it had just been a bit outdated for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, so, with... Um, the 2007 contest, we had Serbia winning. Um, what do you think yeah. about Molitva's win? Do you think that it was uh, deserved? Do you think another country should have won instead? Or do you think that um, it was right to, for Serbia to win, especially on their debut entry as an independent country as well? Molitva has aged like a fine wine. I think it's... I didn't necessarily take to it when I first heard it but then I was 12 and had no taste whereas now I'm 25 and still have no taste <laughs> um, but I remember re-listening to it a couple of years ago and it made me feel so grateful for engaging in the fandom a lot more because I do get to re-experience those moments again and I get to rediscover this music as well and just seeing it compared to all of the other entries and seeing her perform it live again was just so beautiful to me. And I'm abs like, yes, there were other songs I really, really liked, but honestly, I think it was a really well-deserved winner. And I think it's 
stayed a really good winner. Hmm. Um, I think I shared the sentiment that 11 year old me did not really didn't appreciate this for what it was. But now that I'm 24 and I've grown up, like just listening to this sort of music, it's just so powerful and it just has a really big impact on me. Um, all it, it also live, like I just think the staging just it's quite big, but it's quite intimate at the same time. And I think that's just like a really nice touch. And it really, really, it, it, it all, the whole, the song, the stage and everything about it just stands out to me. And I think it does for a lot of people as well. And I think that's why it was so successful. It was a song itself was pretty much more low key than a lot of the other songs within the 2007 final. But I think that was part of its success because I think, we had, I don't think we've had a big ballad win quite a while prior to Maliva winning in 2007. Again, it was like bringing like a, di- a different style of music to, U- to the Eurovision stage and making it win. Like, we, yeah, we've seen like Balkan ballads prior to this in Eurovision, but I do think this is the best one and absolutely the right choice for a winner concerned because it's anything else final Hmm. just the one thing that really didn't age well is the hairstyles of those backing singers oh yes (laughs) like that is the (laughs) most mid-2000s thing that i have ever seen (laughs) oh Oh, um, okay. Well, for me, let's just say twelve-year-old team did not know what the hell what was what the hell was going on, and what <laughs> Serbia was, and what the song was. So, twelve-year-old me did not appreciate this. But then, um, now that I'm nearly twice the age, oh god, um, <laughs> twice the age now, twenty-four. I think I can appreciate it more because I think. Part of it is like you might not understand it then, but then you've aged, you've gained some more experiences in life, and I think that you kind of get the emotion there and then because you can kind of understand the song for its meaning. As when I was a kid, I I just I just focus more on what I see on TV, I because I don't think I just see, but then again, as you grow up, you kind of delve into it much deeper. But another thing I liked as well was when when they had the winners reprise, the fact that they decided to do it by the catwalk, and then everyone was just gathering around Marie and all the backing singers. Yeah. It, and it it kind of reminded me of like Arcade when it won in Tel Aviv, how they were just all on stage and just standing there, and then everyone's just enjoying the atmosphere and the vocal. Yeah, I think I think that's really nice, just because. It kind of brought the 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 audience in with that as well, mm-hmm. and of course, um, I don't know if this is anything that this might be kind of mind blowing, but no actual country used that catwalk during any of their staging. So, having the winner actually perform the winning reprise in that catwalk in the midst of all of the all of the audience, I think that was really nice because it was kind of everyone sharing the same moment. Myself personally, I eight year old me was still quite um caught up in the fact that Ireland came last and Ireland coming last was very like disheartening and I was like, Why doesn't why doesn't Europe like us? So I didn't necessarily think that much about Molitva when it first mm-hmm. uh, when it won. But looking back on it, it has aged very, very well. Um Again, I mean, the staging itself was was stellar because you didn't need to do a lot for that kind of song, really, because the the story was being told from the vocals and from the singer. And so it didn't really need all of these fireworks or anything like that. But um, I think it was deserved. I do think, though, had it been 50-50 juries, I, I think it could have been maybe a little bit more of a runaway winner because I definitely mm-hmm. think juries would have eaten that that sort of music up because it was intense, it was deep, it was personal. And then just as well for own sort of 
queer representation as well. Like Maria Sharifovich, while she wasn't specifically out as a lesbian at that time, she was the first queer winner of the contest following Dana International. So, and to come from a country like Serbia as well, who you wouldn't necessarily think would be kind of open and tolerant with kind of sending artists who would be LGBTQ+. I think it's something that, you know, it needs to be noted. But yeah, I, th- I, think it, it, I think it did deserve to win. And I think the following year, obviously, Belgrade hosted and RTS put on a fantastic show as well. But I do mm-hmm. think it would have been more of a runaway winner if the juries were involved. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. If it's any consolation to eight-year-old Rory, 25-year-old Rosie is also bitter that Ireland came last. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I'm a proper slut for Irish folk music. I love that stuff. I will eat that stuff up. I, I've i learned Irish dancing. I've taken classes. I've, 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 I, I can't get enough of it. And I just adore all the sound of it and so i'm really sad that that came last as well but um (laughs) even just to kind of uh even just coming to uh finland's kind of overall production of the show do you think that finland put on like a really good show or do you think that there could have been places where it could have needed some improvement Mm -hmm. oh i can i can think of this um for the for 2006 if you if we were back in 2006 and yeah but the, if you compare it to what we've had since then, I think it. I think like um, it will be in the lower, lower end of the scale. But then again, I think this was what. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think this was one of the first content that were broadcast in like high definition. So it's like everything's just like looking ten times better, and the graphics were there, and also. What else can I think about it? Um, and all of the visuals and all the graphics were kind of amazing and looked really sleek on screen. So we were watching it Saturday. It's like, oh God, this could pass as a 2016, 2017, 18 show and no one would even notice. It's been really interesting doing it as part of Eurovision again because mm-hmm. I've been because I've been exposed to all of these different contests throughout history and. I missed the week where they showed uh, 1997, and I'm really sad. But even just watching contests back from sort of 2009 and that sort of thing, and the production is so different. Um, And I feel like some of them have definitely aged better than others. And I feel like the only main thing that I remember from 2009 is that bit where Dima Balan gets his coat stuck. (laughs) (laughs) I think... I think they got just the right balance in Helsinki in sort of between sort of showing off their culture and putting on some really cool acts and things like that, but not taking too long over it and really letting it be the sort of the night of the artists. And also I think the hosts were fantastic. Oh, oh, Mikko Leppelampi, come find me. I will give you my number. I will give you everything. (laughs) Who was that guy who was the spokesperson and just started reading his phone number out live on air because he had a special post? Paul DeLue. Yes. Paul DeLue. Oh, God. He's the one that said um, Serbi, that Maria Sharifovic was Kelly Osbourne. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I know, honestly. But um, (laughs) personally, no, I, I really enjoyed 2007 as a production. I think they really did... I, I... during the during the actual pr- like presentation of the show during Eurovision again, I saw a lot of people criticizing the postcards, but by that and that during that time, um, we have to remember that pre two thousand and eight, the postcards weren't necessarily anything to do with the participating countries. They were more about showing off life in the host country, mm-hmm. and that's why um, like Finland tw- Finland's uh, postcards in 2007 were a lot more focused on skiing and uh, the Moomins and going Nordic skiing and all of that kind of thing and Nokia as well, that's another one um, <laughs> <laughs> Who could have forgotten Nokia? Brother Christmas and the Moomin sharing a cup of tea together And Ooh. playing chess together as well Who wouldn't, yes. love, who wouldn't mm. love that? But yeah, I think it was a it was a really well produced show. I uh, two thousand and seven, and this is this is a an opinion that I will 
die on to my it's still an opinion though but that i will take to my dying grave uh 2007 had the best visual identity of the entire 21st century the kaleidoscope effect the uh color scape of it the stage i do think the stage possibly could have had a little bit more leds on the floor but obviously the way that it was designed, it, the, the way that the stage was supposed to be designed as like a Finnish musical instrument, I think it's called the the Kantele, I think is what it is. Forgive me for my terrible Finnish pronunciation. I think it really was a very well put on show. I think a lot of countries, especially take for, take for example, uh, Azerbaijan, take for example, Sweden, they take a very kind of clinical approach where it's not necessarily yeah. supposed to be their culture or they go too hard whereas i think finland put on a finnish show mm, yeah. definitely yeah like mm. i'm just looking at like the opening acts and like the interval acts they all had a very finnish feel and like there's been, obviously been countries that have brought in like international performers specifically for their for their like interval act like justin timberlake 2016 mm-hmm and Madonna last year, like <laughs> we don't bring that up. That's <laughs> <Yes>, not. <laughs> but um, yeah, but while in Finland, like all, all, all their like opening acts and interval acts were very very local, and also they didn't take too long about like opening acts. Like I think we've seen some openings like 2015 and 2018 take up to half an hour to like get into like the first song whereas like this was like in the first like 10 minutes which I think Mm -hmm. is something I appreciated but would be very shocked if I was to see something like that now I think the last time anything like that was probably 2012 was in Baku Mm -hmm. I think so yeah somewhat along that line yeah however I think like Finland did the whole like getting through everything quickly a lot better than Baku did I think it was Baku it felt a little bit off but with Finland I think like you still got to see like their, their culture like within their mm-hmm. act, within their interpreting acts so I think it it kind of balances out hmm. yeah I think I think as well um there's just one more thing that I have to add I know this is going to be a very controversial opinion hashtag controversial opinion um but I really enjoyed Krisa I think she was hilarious. I loved how she was so dry. 20 minutes ago, I was nobody. And now I'm everybody. (laughs) Uh, Like, given some of the green room hosts we've had, I'll take her any day. Oh, yeah. Because, like, sorry, good luck to you, but I have to go. (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, she she was a personal favourite of Mm -hmm. mine. But again, I think it was very much a finished show anyway. Mm-hmm. So um, to kind of wrap things up, if Finland was to host again, what do you think they should work on? Or what do you think that they should keep from the 2007 contest? Uh, I think just as I've reiterated, like making sure like the interval acts and the opening acts stay very cultural and they show off like your culture. And like yeah like just not like going off on a tangent like some countries have done and because i think part of like being the host country is that we like to see what your country is all about and like, the opening and into that give you the opportunity to see that i think the one thing that i would change and this is with my very current day hat on um is i would probably change the postcards and i say that as someone who really likes the sort of the the best postcards for me are the ones that blend showing off the host country with a bit of focus on the artists so i really like 2014 2017 2019 Mm -hmm. Mm. um i love those postcards i think they're just such a delight and in the 2017 one particularly i really like that sort of 
freeze frame montage they do just before they go on stage where they've got all of the people that go into putting that performance together yeah yeah um sort of and you sort of see everyone and it's not just the artist but you can see so many people around them and i think that's wonderful so i would change the postcards to be something that's less like hey look at finland and be and more like here's finland also here are some artists um and there are other ways to show off your country while you're doing that um so you can do um interval acts and opening acts that do show off finland in other ways um yeah like i think having something like the 2019 post they're dancing in like areas of of israel i think that i really personally liked because it was showing off their country and also showing off their culture with having some of these dance the dances i think were quite cool either either to israel or to the artist Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely which which i think is very very important that you keep it like maybe have them dancing in Finland but then maybe have it be like cultural dance the the country the artist from so it stays quite art central centric I think the only thing with that is that if the the UK representative will probably end up like Morris dancing or some shit like that. <laughs> oh, we don't want that. We do not want that. Imagine if it was like Daz Sampson Morris dancing. Oh my god. Be iconic. <laughs> I'd watch the fuck out of that. Choices, I think, would be made. Yeah. Choices would be made. <laughs> um, I say one thing I would say is I'd like them to return to the fact that we just had, we just got on with it within twenty minutes. We were already seeing an act. That's all I'm gonna say. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. As much as as much as I love the flag parade, but seriously, these shows are starting to get long, and Finland <laughs> just got it right, like three minutes and thir- three hours and thirty minutes done. That's not bad. Yeah. 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 I think well, the the whole point, I guess, of the final is to make it like a night for the family. So I understand yeah. why they'd kind of want it to kind of be over the three hour mark but once it gets over the four hour mark i think that's when it needs to kind of get a little bit reeled in but yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. my person i personally enjoy the flag parade so i wouldn't mind that as much but um i think for me the main thing is um a lot of the national identity does need to be carried over uh i think a lot i think personally 2007 was quite a slick year for me and I think if they carried on that kind of professionalism into the next time they'd host, I think it would be really, it would put on a really good show. I think a, a, I find Finnish people to be very creative as well. And I think, you know, with the style of the the visual identity of 2007, I think, you know, and how uh, UMK even itself brings in just a complete different range of styles of music, I think, mm-hmm. um, I think if they could kind of incorporate that kind of diversity into the show, into into a future show, I think Finland could possibly be one of the most, like they could put on one of the best, well produced shows in in years, really. But that's just mm-hmm. my choice. That's just my opinion. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so are there any sort of closing points on the 2007 contest? Not as much, but other than Kitos for hosting an amazing show, and we keep it to our dear hearts. Yes, Kitos Suomi. Kitos! Kitos Suomi! Kitos Suomi! I, I was gonna try and say, <laughs> I was gonna try and do like a, some really big Alexis Costalas um, kind of ramble during the Creek Televote. Thing, and I don't think that probably would be really worth it but yeah I, I, I do really enjoy the 2007 contest I do think it should be one that goes down in history for a long time and I think it should be something that people should reference you know because it seems to be a controversial year but its production value was really well I think um, also I think as well you know, we just appreciate the fact that a lot of the songs and a lot of the artists that have come from that or were involved somewhat with the 2007 contest have still gone on are still relevant nowadays so i think Mm -hmm. 2007 really is a good turning point for the contest Mm -hmm. definitely 
No, it's just great to revisit yeah. it, to be honest. And it's one of the things that I'm loving about Eurovision again as a concept is sort of being able to revisit these years of my childhood, but also having a whole community on Twitter to be able to do it with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just think that's really lovely. It's the yeah. sort of thing that, particularly in a year like 2007, where Twitter wasn't really a thing then. Yeah. So it's really think... interesting to sort of get that sort of, it's almost like what could have been. Yeah. Except like, it is. Like seeing people like, talking about like 1997 2007 on twitter really really interesting because it felt like almost watching for the first time because like it's the first time that we've managed to like gather all our mutual on twitter and just see everybody's different opinions on different things and how it's produced i think that i think for that this eurovision again initiative has been really good and you've got to just thank them and the eb and also the ebu for getting on with it definitely um i think i think that it, that's amazing for them and, and ama it's amazing for us because like we're getting like access to these concerts now on youtube which i think prior to this we didn't have before like we didn't have access to these mm -hmm. and i think it's really like helpful mm. to like see these contests again and tweet a lot yeah yeah i think i think it's definitely something we need to thank uh eurovision again and the ebu for just because if we didn't have this i think it would have made the current pandemic and the fact that eurovision 2020 being cancelled i think it would have made everything a lot harder so i think this is a really good way for people to kind of enjoy eurovision as best as they can really and for that, I just really want to say thank you to the main guy, Rob Holly, and, uh, and mm -hmm. all of the other people as well who who are involved with it as well. I know Dr. Ellie Mead, I think is her name. Um, she's involved. She's like their own Yonola San. She, need, she needs to get her own Take It Away. We will start an initiative to get her own Take It Away. <laughs> but um, honestly, I, do, I think we should all really be thanking thanking them for getting mm -hmm. us through this time. So right. honestly, I'm just going to just give a little clap just to say thank you for it. Because it's really nice. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, First we clap for the NHS, then we clap yeah, for the Eurovision again. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag clap for Eurovision again. Hashtag clap for Eurovision again. Let's start, <laughs> let's start a, a Twitter initiative now. We will get this trending. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but yeah, so this is it. This is the end of the, this is episode of uh, That Eurovision Podcast. Once again, I'd love to thank Rosie, Tim and Jazzy for coming along on this fantastic ride. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll all be going back to our normal uh, con country run through thing. We may also have a couple of other retrospective years as well, depending mm. on... Uh, what Eurovision again provides us with and mm -hmm. for the meantime please do follow us on our social media we're on Facebook mm -hmm. Instagram and Twitter at that Euro podcast we're also on Spotify as well so you can also listen to us on Spotify as well and we're also on WordPress mm -hmm. as well so mm -hmm. be sure to have be subscribed to us on all of our social media platforms so that you know when uh, the next episode of that Eurovision podcast is out so mm -hmm. uh, will we say Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I still love Mr. Baby. I still love Mr. Baby. <laughs> <laughs>